Welcome to Third Floor Views, a production of Chesapeake Family Life, where we talk about health, education, and living with kids. I'm your host, Janet Jefferson. Today, we are discussing the Annapolis Police Foundation, the Annapolis Police Department, and community outreach. Here with us is Peter Grimm of the Annapolis Police Foundation, Judy Budensick of the Annapolis Police Foundation and Annapolis Police Scholarship Fund, and Lieutenant Kevin Krause from the Annapolis Police Department. So a huge thank you for all of you for taking some time to be with us here today. Um, I know that it's a, it's a busy time right now. Um, to our viewers, please feel free to submit any questions or comments you have in the comment section, and we will try to get to as many of those as we can. Um, let's jump right in. Um, so first, let's sort of start with the basics. Um, and I just want to hear a little bit about the mission of the police foundation, the Annapolis Police Foundation. Um, and so, Peter, why don't we start with you? Sure. So um, thanks for having us on and uh, giving us a chance to talk about the foundation and the great work that uh, the police department does out in our community. Uh, we founded the foundation at the beginning of 2019. And really, the reason we exist is to help raise charitable money to support the great work, uh, particularly that the Community Services Division does at APD. Uh, and that's the group that Lieutenant Krauss uh, leads. And hopefully, we'll get a chance to talk about some of that great work today. Definitely. Um, so it's a pretty um, recent organization then. Um, what really prompted um, everyone to to start that? Well, I think we saw a need in the community and, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, it's been in the news a lot recently, uh, the importance of the relationship between the police department and our communities. Um, and we're really fortunate uh, in Annapolis as citizens to have uh, a police department that really focuses and invests in the community. Um, but, you know, resources are limited. So uh, we wanted to bring together uh, the community to be able to fund more of those types of activities and, and enable Kevin and his team uh, to do even more great stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a crazy time right now. Um, and, and we'll definitely get into to some of those details. Um, Judy, could you just talk a little bit about the Annapolis Police Scholarship Fund and a little bit about that mission and how that came about? Sure. That was started um, with the 150th anniversary of the police department four years ago. Um, and Lieutenant Krause had $3,000 and gave three scholarships out. Um, the next year, they were able to raise $2,000. And so they gave two scholarships out. Um, that's when he called me uh, about six weeks before the event we created. <laughs> he said, I got an idea. <laughs> um, we hit the ground running. I suffer from chronic volunteerism, so I, it was an easy phone call to make. <laughs> but we went door to door and asked businesses to help us and give us prizes. Um, the market house stepped up and gave us their venue and we sold tickets to VIP tickets. You could come early and get a, a cocktail um, and then regular tickets. And then all of the prizes that we, we um, received were silent auction and live auction. We had the fabulous Joe Gormley was our auctioneer. Um, and that was the first year that St. John's uh, put their tickets on sale secretly for croquet. Um, and I know some fabulous people there. So I called them and we got, they made a prize package for us, the last tailgate spot. Mm. Um, and you got 10 tickets, drink coupons and a spot for your tent. And that was the largest in the live auction. We got a thousand dollars for that. Um, wow. so it was an unbelievable, I mean, everybody just jumped in and, and did it. And it was phenomenal. We raised $20,000. Um, that night. And Lieutenant Krause's goal is that we don't just give them for their first year. And the scholarship's good for um, college or trade school, which is another beautiful thing. Um, but if they're going to a four-year school, we want to give them the money each year. So we were trying to build a reserve to be able to do that. So that really saved us this year um, because we were still able to do it. But last year we gave away nine scholarships. Oh, that's great. That's really great. Um, Lieutenant Krause, can you talk just a little bit about um, what has community outreach looked like um, over the years um, and maybe before um, the Annapolis Police Foundation began and so the work that you were doing then and then how the Annapolis Police Foundation has changed that? Right, so I took over the uh, Annapolis Police Community Services back in 2017 
And just to give you an example how far we have come over the last four years, back in 2016, they did approximately about 120 to 130 events for the year, which was pretty good for you know, throughout the community. Well, now we're up over a thousand wow. events and community activities. Yeah. So the big thing is just for us to be able to get that information out to the public, mm -hmm. because so many times, you know, people complain, oh, the police aren't doing anything when really we are out in the community doing everything, whether we're at the schools um, we teach character counts. We teach dare at the schools. Um, we just go have lunch with the kids at school sometimes. And we just kind of rap with them and just try to find out what's going on in their, in their life and in their world. Because, you know, I, I actually have a five-year-old and uh, a son who's getting ready to turn 10. So I can relate to a lot of the kids that are in elementary school because I'm dealing with the same issues with my kids. And uh, so we get that good uh, reaction and stuff like that. Um, we've increased our summer camps. Um, before I took over, they were doing about one or two camps a year. Now we're doing about 12 to 13 camps a year. Wow. So, you know, we're affecting about 330 kids during the summer for our camps and then about 5,000 kids throughout the year in just different events that we attend and do. So it's, it's been phenomenal. Um, prior to the foundation, everything we did has always been based off of basically donations. The city has never put up money. Um, towards community services for the police department. So we've always had to try to go out and I've always been out there hustling, trying to get people to donate to us just so I can, you know, be able to afford our camps and, and all other things we do. We also have an Annapolis Kids Club where we take the kids to different, we take them to museums. We took them to DC back in October. Um, and a lot of the kids had never been to the museums just to see their eyes. They were just like, oh my God, I cannot believe it. Like I'm in a museum and there's like, you know, all the dinosaur right there and all this other kind of stuff. So it's very rewarding for us also, but it's very rewarding for the kids. Um, but anyway, getting back. So, so the foundation was kind of brought in to kind of help us be able to fund more in the community. Um, like I said, so I, you know, I would go out to old restaurants and stuff like that. And I would say, hey, could you guys maybe cut us a break on this meal? Because I only have this amount of dollars, you know. Mm -hmm. Where now that the foundation is starting to raise more money, we can actually support our local businesses, especially now that COVID's here. Mm -hmm. Um, Lieutenant Krause, is that common that cities um, don't provide a lot of funds for community outreach? That I'm not sure about. I haven't really looked into that, into other uh, communities and stuff like that. Um, but like I said, we've been very lucky. The community itself has really reached out to us and donated um, pretty much anytime I need something. I just kind of reach out to the community and they seem to always come through for us. That's great. Um, can you talk about why community outreach is so important? I mean, we have to have that connection with the community. I think that's what's happening in some of these other departments where they're having these issues throughout um, the United States and actually throughout the world, but really in the United States where, you know, they're having these, these officer interactions that seem to be going bad. And we just don't seem to have a lot of that in Annapolis. And I think because we've built the trust of the community, and I think a lot of those other agencies just haven't been out there and haven't built that trust. Just to give you an example, we had um, some people come in and do an audit not too long ago, about a year or so ago, and um, they came through and we, we sat down and we talked about all the community stuff. And they actually said to, uh, these were chiefs that were a chief from uh, New York, one of, the, one of the departments in New York City, and I think it was a chief from Georgia and someplace else. And they came in, they could not believe the amount of outreach that we're doing. They're like, you guys have mm -hmm. got to be not only tops in your state, but probably tops in the country when it comes to the amount of stuff that we're doing with a small department, with a small budget, and yet we're still out there involved in all the communities and um, you're just you know, trying to bring the communities together and relate to the police department. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak to just a few of the projects that you're working on right now? So I know um, I was uh, speaking with Pete about this just earlier about Shop with a Cop was just started yesterday, the first session. Right. So if you could just, right about what is Shop with a Cop and sort of what are some of the other projects that you guys are working on right now? Right, so Shop with a Cop, this is our second year of doing it. Um, we do it around Christmas time also, but <laughs> when we do it around this time of year, it's more about trying to get the kids, a lot of the kids um, that are in our communities that really need the extra help or the extra money to either purchase clothing, whether it's uniforms or even school supplies or whatever it is, we usually grab about 10, 10 to 30 kids. I think this year we're doing 30 kids all together over a course of three weeks. And we'll take them to Target and we just kind of walk through with them and they pick out their clothes and they pick out their school stuff, whether it's earbuds. Of course, now a lot of things is earbuds because everybody is working and schooling from home. Right. Um, so we're dealing kind of with that stuff. Um, but it's a great experience because the kids actually get to see the officers in a different light. Mm -hmm. And that's my goal with our police department and every police department should be doing this. They should try to make 
the community see that we are people. Yes, I wear a badge. And yes, I may have to come arrest one of your family members if they do something wrong. But in general, we're all people. We still have to go home to our families every night. You know, so you know, we try to be as safe as we can with them and we want them to be safe with us. Mm -hmm. And it all comes down to respect and it all comes down to trust in the community. And the more trust we can build, I think the more people are to, to let us in and help them when they have an issue. Mm -hmm. And we're doing pop-up pantries right now um, with a couple different churches and we're doing about three a week. And when we're out there, the people just can't thank us enough for being involved and helping them. And, you know, whether it's, um, you know, just giving them food or giving them other, um, uh, whether it's even toiletries or whatever it is that they need, you know, if they come to us and say, hey, I need X, Y, and Z, we try to find X, Y, and Z for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. You have the response to witness it. It will take it to a whole nother level. I've been at the food pantries and watch these cars come up and they're, he's greeting them by name. The people that are driving these cars, they're like, Hey, LT, how are you? You know, so maybe being down on your luck that month or what happened with COVID and you're out of work, there's no shame because it's family. They're looking at him. I laugh sometimes. I'm like, Oh, Oh, rock star is here. Um, <laughs> but you know, they're like, Miss Patty, um, Mr. Joe, they, the, the bond there is absolutely beautiful. I, I invite you, you should come, uh, if you can come to Target next week. Um, there was a conversation between um, Joe and one of the girls, you would have thought they were blood relatives because of, <laughs> yeah. she was calling him for help. As he said, if you ever need anything, call me. Uh -huh. And she's like, well, you told me. He's like, but you called at 3 a.m. <laughs> And I love it. It was the sweet, like, it was just so funny. She's like, I don't understand. I was up. <laughs> um, that's, you know, that's something really, really precious to see in action. Definitely. Um, how has uh, both the sort of fundraising side of it and the outreach side of it changed with, um, with COVID? Um, Peter, why don't you start with, um, with that? Um, and maybe what is it, how do you raise money right now? It's, yeah. it's a really, it's a really tricky time. <laughs> it is tricky. And we've, we've, um, you know, working closely with uh, Lieutenant Krauss, we've, we've adjusted what we're raising money for, mm. too, not just how we're raising it. So, you know, Judy mentioned the, the spring fling for the scholarship fund, which was a fantastic event last spring. We couldn't do it this year. Right. Uh, so, the, you know, it's heartbreaking. But uh, so those kinds of in-person fundraising activities are, are tricky now. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've had a lot of success. We've been privileged to partner with the uh, Annapolis Backpack Collaborative over the last couple of weeks. And this is just a group of local nonprofits and concerned citizens and teachers who saw a need and came together to, uh, uh, to supply some of the, the, the children from these communities with you know, the basics they need to do a virtual school, right? So earbuds and uh, supplies they need at home. And the schools are giving them Chromebooks, which is great. But when you got four kids, as Lieutenant Krauss can testify, <laughs> uh, you got four kids right next to each other all talking and then nobody can hear anything. So, you know, we focused on those types of issues and uh, it's been great. So the fundraising um, has been all online for that, mm. um, obviously using social media and, and Judy's a, a wizard from a, a marketing standpoint <laughs> and, and helping us do that. So we've, we've had a lot of success. So we've raised almost $15,000 in like two weeks, wow. uh, which tells you how... Uh, how much um, generosity there is in our, our in our community when you give people uh, somewhere to focus that, and that's really what we're trying to do is just put the infrastructure in place and and, and put the the uh, that channel so that we can channel all that generosity into these really important programs. Mm -hmm. Judy, what um, so Peter just mentioned that not only how you're raising money has changed, but also what that money's going towards has changed as well. And you mentioned a little bit about food pantries. What are some of the other things that have popped up recently that are different um, that you weren't doing maybe this time last year? I think the biggest thing has been the Backpack Collaborative because uh -huh. it came about that we learned um, that all of these students were in need. And um, it's funny because all of the people working from all those other organizations, um, we laughed. We were like, oh, we know them from Eastport working together. We know them from this drive, that drive. So um, I think they all just got together and went, we're going to them. Um, so it was, it was a natural fit for that. Um, normally this time of year, we would have been just starting our planning for next year. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to 
really um, demonstrate that in the time that we put together this year's program, which had even more prizes and a lot more going on, um, we canceled the event twice. And then it was inappropriate to hold all those gift cards, especially the ones for restaurants while they're struggling. Um, so we returned all of those things. Yeah. And, we, and we did a huge, oh, I'm sorry, Judy, I was just gonna mention the, the Feed the First Responders effort too. And, and right. a partnership, a great to, partnership with Warrior Events mm -hmm. earlier in the year where you know, as, as everything was shut down with, with the pandemic, particularly the restaurants in, in our community, which we as residents all get a ton of value out of. And that's part of the reason we love living here. Um, we were able to raise a tremendous amount of money to not only uh, support the first responders who are out there on the front lines dealing with the pandemic, but also channeling those resources to the local restaurants as well. So we raised money and would buy meals from the restaurants. And, you know, certainly it wasn't enough to, to uh, stem the tide for them, but at least it was something. Right? It was something. Again, it's just finding those ways to channel that generosity that's out there in our community. It sounds like you as an organization are this incredible glue that's sort of connecting different people who are there to donate, but then also are in need, whether that be kids who need earbuds or, or restaurants who have something to give or maybe need help themselves. So as, as a police department and as a foundation, really being that behind the scenes glue that's sort of holding the community together does that that does that how it is that how it feels so the way i view it is we're, we're here to provide resources and <laughs> kevin and his team do all, all the really hard work we do all the glue <laughs> <laughs> they're the glue <laughs> oh man um so 2020 has been um quite the year so not only are we in the middle of a pandemic but we're also in a moment where we're really taking a deep look at some of the systemic racism in our country um and um, a lot of, of police departments have been in the media um, that are really struggling with that. Um, how um, has your role, um, Lieutenant Kraus, changed um, this year with um, thinking about how you address systemic racism and communicate that with community outreach? You know, overall, you know, I've been in Annapolis for almost 24 years now, and we have really not had a lot of issues, especially racial issues in the city of Annapolis per se. Um, you know, so we're really not changing a lot. I mean, we're out there. There have been some um, Black Lives marches and movements that have come through the city. They've all been very peaceful. Officers, that, officers have actually gone out and walked mm -hmm. with the demonstrators. So, I mean, you know, I, I, I want to say Annapolis is very close knit. You know, I mean, I like the fact that when I go into a community, I've gotten the recognition because I've been here for 24 years and the rest of my crew, and I want to mention them, Patty Norris, uh, Nicole, Sergeant Nicole Vaden, and I, we currently just received uh, Ulster Tom Piles. We go into communities and they know us so much they just want to come and give us hugs. Obviously with COVID, it's a little bit harder than that. So it's really tough because the kids still want to come hug you all the time. And it's kind of like, you still kind of do a half hug, but it's like, ah, you know, I really should be doing this, you know? But, um, but the kids just, they, they, they miss that, you know? And, um, but we really haven't had many issues, you know, like I said, we see the other departments and I think a lot of it happens because they don't have that community outreach. They don't have that connection with the community. Has, um, so that's, that's really great that that's sort of how, how it's been and how you're feeling. Um, but is this um, giving you a moment to maybe think about how messaging changes to um, kids and families of color or um, how you address some of the different populations that are in Annapolis? You know, we try to address everyone the same. We don't, we don't really look at people as color. You know, if, if a kid's a kid and, and a, an adult's an adult, we don't, we don't really break that down separately. Um, like I said, we really haven't had a lot of issues. I mean, people have come up and say, hey, you know, are all cops bad? And it's like, no, I mean, every single job out there has bad apples. You know, whether it's a bad surgeon, whether it's a bad, you know, teacher, whatever it is. I mean, everybody has bad apples. The thing is to try to eliminate those bad apples. As soon as you see an issue coming up, you need to nip that in the bud. And if you need to get rid of that person, you need to get rid of that person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so so luckily, like I said, I mean, going back my 24 years, I mean, I can only recall maybe one or two incidents that, you know, officers had been fired for doing something that they should have done. It wasn't necessarily racist, but it just wasn't inappropriate more. And um, like I said, we just haven't had those issues in Annapolis. Um, 
has what has the community reaction been to um, the work, the outreach that you've been doing, particularly this summer and as we start to move into fall, both in light of COVID and with um, sort of this moment of racial reckoning? Um, has the way the community is, has it changed? Is the community more excited to see you because there's maybe more need right now? Um, or are they maybe a little bit more hesitant because, because of the way that police have been uh, portrayed in the media and some of the events that have occurred? Right, you know, I think you get a mix. I think you get the people who are, um, who maybe that we haven't interacted with yet or haven't touched somewhere in their lives. They're definitely skittish still, you know, and, and they'll, 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 most of the time they'll either try to avoid us or something like that. And, and, I'm, and unfortunately, I'm the kind of guy where I say hello to everybody. So if you're walking away from me, I'm still like, hey, how you doing? You know, and I just want to like have a conversation with you. And they're like kind of walking like they don't want to, I guess they don't want to have the interaction. Hmm. But I think all officers should be doing that because eventually then people will see like, hey, you know, we're not out here to just harass you. We're not out here to, to lock you up. We're here because, you know, there's a need in your community and we're here to help you and make the community better for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, what about how Annapolis compares, um, to the surrounding region? I think Annapolis is, is a really interesting town because we are sandwiched in between Baltimore or not quite sandwiched. We're in a triangle with Baltimore and DC. Um, and both of those are our larger cities and they have their own challenges, um, and their own, um, things that are really unique about them. Um, and, and Annapolis is not DC and it's not Baltimore. Um, it's but <laughs> I love it, Judy. Um, I'm from New York city. So there, <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, we are in this very unique geographic region that, that we are impacted by what goes on in Baltimore and DC. Um, but yet it's really different. Um, so how does the Annapolis community fit into that greater DC Baltimore region, um, in terms of some of the challenges around policing and specifically community relations? Right. You know, so I would say we have basically the same challenges as those larger cities, mm -hmm. just on a lot smaller scale. I mean, we have homicides. We have a lot of drug activity in the city. You know, uh, unfortunately, most of the most of the issues that we have are coming from outside the city. So, you know, when I go into different um, either housing area, whether it's a hack of property or wherever it is, you know, ninety nine percent of those people are good people. It's the one percent that's letting in people, whether it's a boyfriend or just you know uh, some sort of relative or some other person that just friends with them. They decide to come from DC or Baltimore, and then they start trouble basically in our city. Um, so we've been trying to nip that in the butt. And I think but by us continuing to build the relationships that we have already built and, and continue to build those relationships stronger, I think maybe we can weed a lot of that out. You know, mm -hmm. that, that seems to be the biggest issues that I see um, when it comes to us. But like I said, we, we have the same issues. We just, we have them on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you feel like are some of your biggest successes that have occurred maybe over the past year? I mean, there's, there's so many, I mean, um, you know, this, like I said, 2020 has been a rough year. I mean, it, it, there's, there's not much else that could go wrong. Of course I say that and watch, we'll have, you know, some crazy hurricane yeah, or something can you not come, say up, that? come up the bay, <laughs> you know, something like that along those lines. But I mean, you know, I mean, I can say 2019 was a huge success. Like I said, we did over a hundred activities. Um, we were really involved with the, with the community. We gave out nine scholarships. I mean, just, it seemed like everything just start, started hitting uh, um, in a row and just started like basically falling into place, mm. you know, um, you know, over the summer months, we, we had a few hiccups. So we had, we had, a, a I want to say a, a crime increase through the month of like the end of June, July, and maybe the beginning of August, we had, um, a few shootings and a couple homicides, you know, that our detectives are, are very, um, hard working on right now. So, I mean, that was kind of a back step for us. Um, but the majority of, of um, everything that's been going on over the last year or so, I mean, it's just, it's just been phenomenal. You know, like I said, we just keep building relationships. You know, unfortunately, because of COVID has actually brought us closer together with more people than we would have, because when we do our food banks and our food pop-ups, our pantry pop-ups, you know, we're, we're bringing in anywhere from 300 to 500 families are coming in. So we get to interact with them too. And they get to see us in that light, like, hey, you know, we're helping them. We're not just out here to harass people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, really quickly, 
if there is, how do families know sort of what your events are? Or um, if there's a family in need, how do they connect with you? What's the best way to sort of get in touch with the work that you have been doing? Right. So, I mean, they can, they can email me directly at, um, at uh, KC Kraus, that's K-R-A-U-S-S, at annapolis.gov. Um, if you're having any kind of issues or troubles like that, just email me. I mean, we have lots of connections, whether it's, um, whether it's drugs and you need to get into some treatment or you need some food or you need some clothing, whatever it is. We have a lot of connections throughout the county that we can, um, that we can really dive into and, and get you the help you need. Um, it just seems like a lot of people just don't know where to go. Um, mm -hmm. But the police department, it really can help you more than hurt you. But I think a lot of people have that stigma of like, oh, I don't want to go to the police for this. But the police departments, I think, are changing throughout the country. And I think you'll see that we are becoming more of social workers and more of trying to help the community deal with their issues and actually a lot of uh, mental issues that people have, especially with COVID. I mean, now you're stuck at home. I mean, people are, are going a little crazy. I mean, I'm going a little crazy sometimes, you know? <laughs> I mean, I come home and my family's home all day long and the first thing they want to do is daddy this, daddy that. And it's like, wow, I just need to like decompress for five minutes, you know? <laughs> um, but, but I mean, it is what it is, you know? So, but, but like I said, I think the biggest thing is that, you know, there are resources out there. If you contact me or you contact someone at the police department and ask for community services, whether it's Sergeant Vaden, um, whether it's Joe Hudson, whether it's Patty Norris or Tom Piles, we will definitely reach out and help you. Um, there is one thing I want to talk about real quick. We've just started a program. I know the chief wanted me to talk about this. We did a, a re, we're starting a re-entry program, which basically when people are in jail and they come out of jail, a lot of times they go right back to committing the same crimes because they have no money. They have no place to stay. They're living out on the street. So um, we have an officer Horn who came from Baltimore city and he has started this program. And basically what they're doing is as people get out of jail, they're kind of connecting with them and saying, hey, you know, we can get you into the either halfway houses. We can possibly find you a job if you're looking to get your GED. Um, if you're looking to further your education some other way, we have all these different resources that, that we're starting to put people into. And we're not only doing people that are, that are just getting out of jail, we're also dealing with people that, you know, if you see a kid possibly going down the wrong road, we try to interact. Well, and we go out to the family and we go out to their house and we sit down with, with their family and say, you know, why are you reacting this way? Is it peer pressure? Is it something else? You know, is it drugs? Whatever it is. And we try to get that family help before it gets to the next, next point um, in their lives. And we're also doing the same thing with adults. So if we see adults out there that, you know, we are constantly going out because they're having overdoses, overdose, overdose, overdose. And we're constantly bringing them back basically from the dead uh, with Narcan. We try to get them into treatment. And, you know, a lot of times it's, it's people have to overdose sometimes three or four, maybe five or six, seven times before they'll actually ask for help. Mm. So we're trying to do that, you know, and, and uh, you know, we work with ASAP and we work with a bunch of other groups and, and Judy's part of ASAP. So uh, <laughs> I'll plug her on that and she can tell you a little bit more about ASAP if you're interested, but, um, but they help out too, you know, so, so we're all kind of working together and we have all these, these great places and, and great uh, facilities that are out there that can help people. We just need people to come to us and say, hey, I need the help. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like what you're saying is, is the Annapolis T Police Department does have a lot of really important social services, you know, whether that be literal social workers or, you know, some of the um, work that you're doing is connecting people to, to the resources that are available. Um, one of the big things that you're hearing in the media right now is, um, or maybe earlier this summer, was the idea of defund the police and not to take money away from specifically police officers, not that we don't need police officers, but that we really need also to have money within these sort of social service sectors to make sure that the, the need of the community is being met. But right. what you're saying is it sounds like that's really the work that you are already actually doing today in the community, but it's nested within the police department. Um, based on the work that you've been doing for the past four years, do you feel like it makes sense to have all of these social um, networks within the department? Or do you feel like it maybe makes sense to move it and have a different organization be those connectors to people, to those social services? You know, personally, I believe it needs to stay with the police department. And the main reason is, is because we're already out there. So like a lot of times we're already on scene when, when a situation happens. And then if we have to call on somebody outside, it just takes more time. So, you know, if we can, if we can 
get people fixed and get their problems, um, I wouldn't say resolved, but at least, you know, on the right track. I think that that's why we kind of want to keep it with us. I mean, we have crisis intervention officers that are on, and Sergeant Baden is actually a crisis intervention officer, and she's been working with Anne Arundel County. So basically, you know, she's doing all follow-ups on overdoses already. Um, you know, anytime there's a, a, um, if there's a shooting or a homicide or, or a fatality when it comes to um, like a traffic accident or something like that, they come out and they help us make notifications and we make sure the families are set. And, um, you know, so we have a lot, a lot of programs. I mean, literally, it would, I could probably take up two hours just telling you all the different programs that we have, you know, and people are just not aware of them. But that's why, like, I, you know, I, I, I always say to people, like, you know, just, just, you know, call me or email me. If you have a question about anything, you know, I, I usually answer pretty quick and, um, you know, and, and I'll get you or I'll point you in the right direction. If I don't have the correct answer, I'll get the answer for you. So it sounds like the model that, that you've been working on is has been fairly successful in Annapolis, having these social services nested within the department, or at least connecting people, using the department to connect people. Um, do you think this model is, um, could you replicate it? Could you put it in another city? Um, or do you think there's something about Annapolis that makes it uniquely successful? No, I think you could. I think you just have to have the officers that are dedicated. You know, um, I think we have to change the officer's mentality a little bit, you know, where we're not just going out and arresting people and enforcing laws. Like, we're actually there to help people. I mean, I, I always tell this story when I'm out and about and everybody always gets a kick of it. But I knew when I was three years old, I wanted to be a police officer. I would ride, I would ride around on my big wheel and I'd pull all the other neighborhood kids over on their bikes and give them <laughs> pretend tickets. And, you know, anytime I ever saw somebody hurt or or somebody in trouble, I would always stop and help, you know, and it was just like from day one, I always knew that that's what I was going to do, you know. So um, I think, like I said, policing has changed a lot. From when I first came on, it was like, you know, you go out and you make arrests and you write people tickets and you do this, this and that. And now you're more of a social worker. Hmm. You know, now now you're trying to solve the problems either before they become bigger problems or before they become problems at all. And that's what we have to get the community to understand. We need to get all the officers basically to stay on track and try to get and try to buy into that philosophy. Hmm. Right. So it's maybe less about policing and more about social services. Absolutely. Because I mean, you think about it. I mean, there's, there's so many people out there with mental illness and, you know, a lot of the issues they have, um, it, you know, they end up becoming involved with the police department for the wrong reasons hmm. because they have a mental issue, you know? Um, so, so we need to kind of like nip that in the bud and kind of, and kind of react to that. I mean, we have, like I said, we have all sorts of problems. We just started a program, um, two years ago called Annapolis Cares. And basically, um, we go out into the community and stuff like that. And we find people who may not be fully cognitive and we get their information and we can put, um, little bracelets on them. If they want to, they can wear a bracelet. So we've had some Alzheimer's patients that have done this and we've put bracelets on them. And um, in case they wander off, um, we've done it with some autistic children also have been involved in this program. And it's been a great program. It's been a great reach out. And the, the best thing about it is if, uh, say, they, say the officer ends up pulling that vehicle over, the vehicle's identified as having someone who may have a cognitive issue. So this way the officer's already aware of that before they go up and make that interaction. So it doesn't go from zero to 60 it goes to like zero to 10 to zero to 20, you know, and he kind of, this way the officer can kind of do the building blocks on it instead of just saying, Oh my God, this person's, you know, acting crazy. I need to pull them out of the car and lock them up. A lot of times it's not like that. They just have to have that knowledge though. Um, that, 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 that's what's going on with that person. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I imagine though, it would be hard to, of course, identify everyone in the community and then Absolutely. also a bit of a slippery slope in terms of like, well, are we, are we going to give everyone a bracelet for all of their challenges? And like, how right, do we right. decide and, that? And, and, we're, and we're really not doing that. We're basically, the, the people that are, are like, I mean, they, they actually have to volunteer into the program mm. and stuff like that. And the bracelet okay. actually does cost a small amount. Um, we've been able to secure about 10 bracelets. So right now we only, I think I have two people in the, in the, in the um, program right now. And so we really kind of facilitate, I mean, you'd really have to really bid off to get a bracelet. And it, really the main reason for the bracelet is to find you. Mm -hmm. because, you know, we've had people in the past who have all had Alzheimer's and they disappear, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes you can find them pretty quickly. But if you don't find somebody within that first, you know, a couple hours, maybe even 20 hours, 24 hours, I mean, chance of them surviving, especially if it's in dead winter or something like that, is not very good. Right. So this is really like a, a life-saving tool more than anything else. And it's also mm -hmm. part of Project Lifesaver. Mm-hmm. 
Well, it sounds like you all are incredibly busy right now um, and have so many um, important community projects going on. Um, so thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing and um, sort of the, the the constant community connections that that are needing to be made and the money that needs to be raised to, to support um, safety and well-being of the community. Yeah, Judy, I feel like you're on the edge of your seat. What are you doing on Thursday? What am I doing on Thursday? I'll have to check my calendar, but tell me more. I think you're coming <laughs> shopping with us. I think you need to shop with a cop. I love it. I love it. And see, so, see your work in action. Absolutely. Um, I let's let's be in touch. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to all three of you. Um, so Peter Grimm and Judy um, Buttonsick and Lieutenant Kevin Kraus for being here with us today to address all of our questions about community outreach and the police. Um, and thank you to all of our viewers and listeners as well. Um, make sure that you visit chesapeakefamily.com for up-to-date information on home, health, and living for today's Maryland parent. This episode will be archived on chesapeakefamily.com in both video and podcast format. I'm Janet Jefferson with Chesapeake Family Life and Third Floor Views. Thanks so much. Thanks, Janet.